Es nezinu, kā jūs, jūs sēdēsiet un stāvēsiet. So, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome here at RBS, those who are present, and welcome those who are online. Um, today, he, we have a pleasure uh, welcoming our dear partner and uh, a great supporter of Riga Business School, uh, HTT Pool. Uh, with a strong expertise in digital marketing and advertising and presence in um, across multiple countries uh, across Europe and Asia, um, HTT Pool exclusively represents major global platforms such as Twitter, LinkedIn, Spotify, Meta and many others. Given their extensive knowledge and expertise, we have invited uh, four highly um, knowledgeable experts uh, in the field of uh, digital advertising and uh, marketing to share with us the latest trends of this uh, ever-evolving industry. Uh, they will be providing valuable insights uh, that we hope will be useful for all of you. And without further ado, let me briefly introduce our panel experts. Um, well, they will introduce themselves uh, more thoroughly during their presentations. Um, we are excited to have them with us today. Martin Schmillers, um, Normund Svutsans, Paul Sparkovans, and Robert Ermanis. It's especially great to have uh, Pauls and Roberts here because they are alumni of Riga Business School uh, Bachelor of uh, Business Administration program and sharing their knowledge and expertise today with us. So let's take the advantage of the experts and enjoy the lecture. Hey everyone, thanks for yeah. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Norman, as was mentioned previously. If you have any sort of questions while I'm speaking, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. I think that will be the most uh, easiest way to, to deal with all the things there might be and uh, also the best use of the time that we have here. So for the beginning, uh, my name is Norman, me, Martin, and Roberts. We are working on SMB team uh, for meta advertising in HED pool. So basically we are helping to grow all the small and medium businesses on uh, meta system and then Paul's he's like the biggest expert we have on Twitter and performance marketing in general so he'll be touching upon those subjects uh, for the most part later on so what we'll do here I will do uh, mainly an introduction to HTT pool as a whole and then meta advertising as a whole uh, Martin should be taking most of the Q&A session afterwards as he has tons and tons of knowledge about lots of different topics and he'll be able to give you lots of very cool insights so if you have anything please shoot at me or Tim and Roberts will be helping out as well with um, tips and tricks which we have lately seen as super important thing on uh, how to make your account secure because uh, in last I would say a few months we have seen unprecedented amount of uh, stolen both business managers, personal Facebook accounts, personal Instagram accounts, and what not else. And uh, that has created quite a lot of issues, both for our clients and uh, for those clients who aren't ours yet, but who would like to work with us. Um, but yeah, if you're speaking about HTT pool as a whole, then uh, basically what we are doing, especially within our team, we are trying to identify those companies who have lots of promise and potential in the market. And then... Uh, we are giving them our resources and our knowledge in order for them to unlock their full potential. And uh, if you're speaking about the way how the support works in general, there are, I would say, four main pillars we are providing from HTT pool. So one is uh, general day-to-day -day support, like ad account audits and understanding how you are spending your money and then suggestions on how you can do it better and how you can earn more from whatever you are doing there. Uh, then the second thing is... Uh, no uh, troubleshooting, meaning if you have some restricted assets, something like that, then we most likely will be able to help you. We aren't the same as Meta, but we are basically the next best thing that you can have in the market. And the same thing applies for uh, Pauls and Twitter and all of the other uh, things. Basically, actually, pool, we should be viewed sort of as an extension for all of these big social media platforms in the local market, which are too small for them to enter on their own. And then we are here in order to help uh, the clients of theirs to spend their money more wisely. So that's basically sort of the mission statement and what we are doing on a day-to-day basis. Um, third big pillar of what we are doing is uh, education questions, meaning uh, we are able to help out with uh, 
uh, things like uh, our own seminars, webinars, meta seminars, webinars, new information whenever some updates are coming, something like that. And last but not least, we are helping also with the accounting things. Uh, either you have a credit line with us or you have a prepaid account, but in either case, it's easier than to come with like uh, 20 different invoices at the end of the month, your accountant and trying to deal with all of it. So that's also sort of is uh, said in this uh, slide as well. So they are uh, quite similar in a way. But yeah, just to give you a couple of uh, meta platform updates and uh, numbers that are there. Uh, so these are the global statistics that you can see uh, how many people are using meta on a daily basis and how many active users there are on Facebook, for example, and that there is a big increase of it. But uh, I think it's even more important to say because recently I have had quite a lot of questions with uh, my clients on how actually meta has been used and Facebook in particular, that like especially you young people aren't really using that. And based on the date that we are having, we don't really see any sort of drops or at the same time real increase in uh, meta usership in uh, Latvia, for example, in the Baltics in general. And uh, for the most part, it's staying pretty much steady. Uh, obviously, there will be a little bit of drop for those users who are like 15 at the moment or something like that. But later on, most of them anyways are joining both the Instagram and on Facebook uh, because it's probably the easiest way how to do basically once uh, one stage login in lots of different platforms and with the use of that also of the messaging even if it's their parents or some of the other folks like I am or whatever uh, they still will be there and you still will be able to show them all of the ads and you will be able to interact with them so in terms of uh, business potential it's uh, very important not to underestimate the stuff that you can still do on meta because it is the biggest uh, social media platform also in Latvia and it's very important to keep that in mind when you're working Again, these are just some of the statistics also on the worldwide level that you can have uh, for both uh, Messenger, Instagram, WhatsApp. All of them are used by billion plus people and two billion people in the WhatsApp case. And so that's just underlines how important it all is. And uh, if you're speaking about the actual performance of Meta, um, how many of you have set up at least one ad in your lifetime? Has there been anyone? Okay, a few. So actually most of you. So that's very, very cool to see, uh, mainly for the fact that uh, that most likely will make our discussion more interesting and it will be uh, easier for you to also understand all of these things. So like this is quite important slide in order to remember, like uh, most of the people, around 60% of them are doing spontaneous purchases when they are seeing an ad on the platform that they are browsing. So if you don't have a super high uh, ticket item and if you don't have something very, very uh, difficult to understand that takes a lot of time you know, to explain how it works and why the person should be buying that, then there is a very good chance that uh, both on Met platforms and some other platforms, you would be able uh, to sell something to your core audience. Another thing that's very important, like people are scrolling a lot and they are seeing tons and tons of information. On average, it's like 500 meters of uh, scrolling just through the Facebook alone. That's at least uh, the data that we are seeing from our side. And on average, like those 1.7 seconds on content, that's actually not fully the case because if you're looking at uh, the uh, at the part that is uh, on the web version, yeah, then on average around two seconds is spent on one post. But if you're speaking about the posts on the mobile versions of it, then approximately 0 0.8 seconds. I have even seen recently a couple of uh, studies where it says it's uh, approximately 0 0.6 to 0 0.5 seconds per one post. So basically, unless you are able to grab the attention of the person immediately with what you are doing, then you just would be losing your audience at that moment. And that sort of ties very nicely together with uh, some of the creative stuff that you'll be speaking about. But it also very nicely ties together in all of the algorithm stuff regarding Meta. And that's probably the most uh, important thing that uh, Meta has on uh, its competitors and uh, the general data amount that the Meta has been gathering because uh, the algorithm itself, it's 18 years old. And for the last few years, we are very much seeing the more you are trusting the algorithm, the more you are giving it a uh, ability, let's say, to breed and uh, to have like as broad placements as possible, uh, have as broad targeting as possible. Unless it's very spe uh, specific niche or it's very, very big markets like all the US's and everything else with hundreds of millions of people living in them, then the broad targeting usually is the best one, especially in terms of uh, the price that you'd be paying for lots of different mental services. So that's also something to keep an eye on. And uh, something that I'm always trying to preach to my customers is that uh, trust the algorithm and even if it doesn't bring you better results, we have seen quite a lot of cases where it gives you very similar to results to what you would be doing on like very specific placements on your own and very specific uh, targeting options and whatnot. You would be spending so much time that there is definitely a better place and better uh, way how you can allocate your time. So uh, don't be afraid of trusting the algorithm. 
obviously, if you have had that experience, there might be those cases. I, in my portfolio, I would say like some 5% of people, maybe 10% of the companies, it's better for them to do some micro-targeting. But in general, most of them are having better results if they are going quite broad. And then um, the next thing we are speaking here about is uh, always have empathy for your customer. And uh, I think that when you are creating a strategy and you're especially you're creating creatives and um, general value proposition, that is uh, a key thing to understand. Uh, put yourself in those customer's positions in the, uh, their shoes in order to understand why would they need the specific thing and uh, what could be the motiva motivational factors for them to do the purchase. Because in general, we'll be speaking a little bit more about that in the uh, retargeting section, which comes up in, uh, up in a little while. But how I'm usually trying to position that, and I think it's a good example, uh, if you want to buy a phone, like for general audience, you would be seeing an ad, oh, there's 20% discount in that store. That's like cool, something you can show for everyone. And then if I don't buy it on the ad, you'd be doing some retargeting afterwards. And then it basically goes you already know about the general product. You already understand what it is. And then there are two main things that can uh, lead to a purchase. So one of them is if you are doing some rational uh, reasoning. So meaning this phone has this good battery life. It has this good screen resolution. It has like uh, some other te technical specs, which you can lean into because already people understand what you are speaking about. But the other factor that might be very important is the emotional factor. Why would they be buying that? And even for as a simple utility tool as a phone, it can be uh, when the 1st of September is coming, you can promote it to uh, all of the new parents of the first graders. And that if you buy this phone, then you'll always know where your kid is at the moment. So just think of all of these things when you're creating ads, uh, maybe not really outside of the box, but uh, try to understand what might be the main reasoning behind it. And also try to understand all of the other underlying reasonings why people would be buying something for you. Um, good example that I have had recently as well was a vegan um, vegan cosmetics brand in Latvia. They were telling me that their uh, core audience and their best audience is uh, uh, school teachers from Talsi and other small cities around 45 years old when their kids have graduated school they have some disposable income and they have some time to spend on that uh, but then we have realized that if they are uh, targeting uh, also men on various ages uh, who don't really know what to give their uh, vegan girlfriends or wives to that's also a very good audience and approximately they're spending 15 to 20 percent of their budget at the moment and having a similar uh, revenue streams coming from this audience which they hadn't tapped into previously so once again always keep in mind what could be the reasons why why they are buying and also don't be afraid of thinking about some of the audience that are not maybe the core that you have here and here, uh, like it all comes down and uh, boils down to both on Met platforms and also on Twitter and all of the other platforms uh, to the how good your creative is. Um, this statistic says 56%. I have seen also uh, statistics up to 67 and 68% that you can have the best targeting in the world. You can have the best everything. But if the creative isn't too good, then most likely you wouldn't be able to uh, promote it properly. So what you would be doing uh, in Meta case in particular, but also it applies to some of the other platforms which you can see very easily as a user. So on Meta, uh, for one ad, ad campaign, in ideal case, you would have four creatives. Two of them would be images. Two of them would be videos. So people can choose whichever placement they are in that moment. So if I'm scrolling after lunch break very quickly, I might see a video, uh, sorry, image. And if I am uh, sitting at home in the evening and watching some long form videos, and I might be seeing a video ad from that advertiser as well. And uh, you would also have these creatives both in the stories format, so meaning vertical one, as well as something to put on feed, whether that is uh, slightly horizontal or square, that doesn't really matter that much. You can see whichever looks better and how you would like to approach with your brand identity. But uh, yeah, even the simple things like that. Most of the companies are not doing that. And even if you can uh, create your creatives like this, this will give you a huge advantage in the market afterwards as well. Uh, we will not be able to share all of the presentation, by the way, because um, quite a lot of slides are coming from it directly. I am definitely not able to see if anyone is making any pictures at the moment. So that you can do with this information, whatever you want. So this is one of the slides I'm not able to show you. Uh, but yeah, so here are a couple of the creative best practices. I think the most important thing to mention here and uh, to remember is if we are speaking about videos and videos are the thing that for the most of the advertisers are working the best. At the same time, don't forget about images because this week I also had one of uh, e-commerce brands who always had relied on videos and now they have super good results from a couple of images that they have made and they're asking me why is that like it I'm like 
why are you complaining? Your results are going down. Your videos are also performing nicely. And the fact that uh, you have created such good uh, high quality image that they are working with your core audience very well, just keep on using them and create something similar to that. And don't be afraid of all of these things. But yeah, if you're speaking about videos, uh, stuff that people usually remember uh, forget, um, especially for the mobile uh, phone version, remember, you start with the most important details and then you go further uh, with all of the rest. So it's basically the vice versa, what you would have in your TV campaigns, because uh, as I mentioned previously, one to two seconds is the average spend for one post. So meaning if you are putting that you have sale, you have to put sale on the very first second. You have basically one second, maximum two seconds in order to grab the attention of the users. Second most important thing is uh, if you're creating those uh, mobile videos, 80% of people are watching mobile videos without any sound. So if you have some voiceovers, always have subtitles on. That's like a must on all of the platforms. And if you don't do it, then you lose very much at that moment already. And basically treat it in a way if someone has the sound on, that's extra delight. But in general, you have to look at them if they don't have the sound on. Uh, and then also people are as they are scrolling through so many posts so many times per day, you have to have a similar branding on all of the content uh, units that you're providing. So meaning if you have your logo on top right corner for this campaign, you have it always on all of the materials on top right corner. If you have like some color blob that you are using as the way how you're identifying your campaigns, always have it in all of the materials in that particular campaign. Just find ways how you can tie it all together and that will uh, give you again, big results in the end, and will be very easy for you uh, to work in the long run. Maybe you have some questions regarding the so far what I have spoken about. Okay, very well. I hope you understand me correctly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, on average, that's like the, that this is the statistics for Meta, but uh, I think that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. On average, uh, so the question was, is it on different social media that the sound is on for 80, off for 80% of people? Uh, this, these are statistics for Meta, but in general, it doesn't really uh, differ for different platforms. Pauls, on Twitter? I would assume it's more or less similar, but for Twitter, it's more basically the best, uh, the same thing also advised, that uh, by default, typically it's sound off, so it's a small portion of people who are actually enabling it. Yeah. Uh, the way how I would be looking at that, unless you have, for example, headphones, most likely if you're in public transport or waiting somewhere in the waiting room, you wouldn't have the sound on. And most of the people are just like that whenever they're browsing the, the social media or whatever. Even if they are not in that sort of situation, they might be, I don't know, at like family dinner and they don't want to disturb their parents, for example. <laughs> but yeah, any other questions maybe before we go further? All right. Uh, yeah, so mobile first creatives, obviously that is very well known and everyone has been speaking about that for 10 plus years, but the way how you should be looking at that at the moment, uh, Roberts was last year uh, visiting uh, Met offices in uh, Dublin and basically the general information that they were saying for the biggest trends that they will have in this year and what we are seeing is that uh, creators and user generated content in general is the stuff that uh, Meta is pushing very much. And that doesn't also only mean like all the big influencers and everything else. Even for a couple of brands, uh, yes, they were speaking with one ice cream brand where they haven't implemented that, but they have been meaning to do that for four years of uh, giving some small discount, like some 5% or something like that for all of their uh, visitors. And you can have like, hey, put a video how you are eating our ice cream, and then we can use those materials as a marketing campaign afterwards. Basically, the more trustworthy is the campaigns that you are creating, uh, the better the results usually will be. I think one of the best examples at the moment in Latvia is, um, and you can see like lots of different ads, uh, there is a company that is selling uh, various uh, light products. And then basically the videos are a guy walking through the store. Oh, so we have this light and then we have that light and then we have this product and we have that product. It is super lo-fi in terms of how it looks. I would assume that it, there goes quite a lot of uh, decision making quite a lot of uh, uh, work into creating it looking so seamlessly but that those are some of the better looking campaigns that I have seen uh, one of my best clients is uh, going against all of the best practices because usually like uh, if you're creating videos for example up to 15 15 seconds is the best one 12 seconds is like the usually sweet spot in the industry and then every 15 seconds more it decreases the performance because that's like one story length and people are not watching that long but I have one um, e-commerce which is selling uh, clothes and uh, we have tested lots of different things. And for them, 
the thing that works by far the best is having 20 minute long videos where a couple of people are going through their store. Oh, we have this dress and then we have this suit and then they are trying them on and showing it. people are watching that sort of as a TV series. There shouldn't be any reason why that would work. I haven't seen it in literally thousands plus accounts in my team uh, for anyone like in any of the countries to are representing that it works, but for them, for whatever reason it does. So that is something to keep an eye on and uh, don't be afraid of doing experiments. Like if it works for you, it's important to have always also meta best practice in general, like all the experimentation best practice would say, put aside five to 10% of your budget monthly to do experiments, whether those are some small placements, whether there are some new creatives, some targeting options, whatnot. Mostly they will not work, but there will be some things that will very much improve your results. But if you have the winning formula, even if it doesn't look as something you should be doing, don't just quit on that just to have it as it should be going because that doesn't bring any good results afterwards. And yeah, so this also sort of underlines what I was speaking before about the user-generated content and the influencers as well. So yeah, 60% of the shoppers are influenced by social media. That wouldn't be a surprise. I would actually assume that the, date is, uh, that the number is a little bit higher. 61% uh, of the 18, 34 year olds are swayed by creators. That looks about right. And that, especially if you're having some smaller uh, ticket items, that definitely goes as you would be expecting. And 81% of consumers purchase based on posts. And uh, those posts can be the friends' posts and everything connected to that. So that also goes if you're running a brand ads, if you have a way to use user generated content, which is actually genuine, that will go a long way afterwards on having good results. So, this again highlights what I was saying before, just to have it live, just to have it uh, realistic and how you would be expecting the content to look like. And here again, uh, the closer you are working with different content creators, the better results usually will be. And it also is uh, quite often easier for your creative department in order to create those creatives actually. If you're speaking about the performance and the setup of campaigns themselves, so this sort of goes away from the creative side, but actually uh, to having it. Uh, so very important thing to remember always is that you first have to define your goals, basically understanding what do you want to achieve, whether those are sales and if they are sales, how do you want to achieve and why is it important? Then have measurable and realistic KPIs and at least have some sort of guess, even if you don't have the data beforehand. What would you like to achieve? If it's uh, sell more, then uh, have some realistic goals. I would like to sell, for example, I don't know, like 20% more than in the previous quarter. By the end of this quarter, that would be a good way to set it up. I would like to sell more, uh, then that's not really a good and uh, too much achievable uh, KPI uh, setup because there isn't really anything to hold on to. And uh, last but not least, follow the best practices. Usually they work, and that's the reason why they are the best practices. And for the most companies, like 90 plus percent, they will definitely work. On meta side, this is like seems super basic. And when you are explaining to the clients, it seems, oh yeah, we already have been thinking about that and we already know all of that, but quite a lot of them are not actually using those power five things. And first of them is auto advanced matching. So basically what would be happening if you have the data pixel set up correctly, uh, conversions API set up correctly, then you don't have to guess on who the people are actually, you already can target them quite uh, easily and uh, get to those people in a very easy to understand manner. Um, second thing is simplified account structure. What does it mean? Um, if you are having, as you mentioned, most of you had already uh, created campaigns, uh, unless you have some very specific and uh, difficult to use product, mostly most of the businesses uh, for the SMB segment in particular would be fine to have two to three campaigns, which would have a couple of ad sets and then quite a, f quite a few ads underneath them. But you don't need to create uh, lots of different campaigns for basically the same thing. One of the worst things you can do is having an audience overlap, meaning that you have, for example, two sales campaigns, uh, where in one you would be selling TVs, another one you would be selling phones, but the audience is basically the same. Then if, in that case, there is no way, no reason why you wouldn't be able to have both of the phone and the TV creatives under one uh, campaign, under one ad set as two different ads, because then the algorithm would understand which of these products are actually working the best for you, and it would be able to find the best audience for it. Basically, the less clutter you have on your ad account, the better results you will have. And it will decrease all of the prices and it will increase all of the results that you are getting. Yeah.
and there is sep yeah, thank you and there are separate uh, plaintiffs for yeah. all of those because those are very different promotions or, or somehow like that so does it mean you have to combine all those products so all those promotions even those are like seven let's say i, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be and, and put it like out to exactly uh, the thing there is uh, it, unless you have high budgets would be which would be like some 50 100 euros per day per, per that particular ad set you shouldn't be going above approximately eight maybe 12 creatives if you want to push it so that should be the upper limit and then you can just like switch off the ones that are performing best uh, worse than worse than then uh, just have something else that's performing better that's only for the fact so you are actually able to show all these creatives to people other than that uh if you are having those different promotions unless you have very specific audience and you just want to sell them all for quite broad audience there's no reason to separate them because unless some of the brands are paying you for example that you need to spend thousand euros on my particular products that could be I would say the only reason why you would be doing it like this uh, then you, I don't think you too much care whether you are showing ad for fridge or you're showing ad for uh, TV if the sales are coming in like it doesn't really matter that much which of the products are going if it if you need to get rid of them in your inventory then it's a little bit different case but then you can also have it sort of as a quick sales compared to the rest of the channels and maybe you want to pause some of the other campaigns at that moment just to push your uh, specific products on I hope it makes sense probably it makes but I'm thinking about practicalities really in daily life when you have a lot of assortment like really uh, multiple those categories consumer electronics a lot uh -huh. of them and you you want to sell them all and you have promotions for everything and then how you are doing them how you are where to find that capacity to create those creatives and um, map those audiences and then there should be separate creatives for those who uh, are not target audience for all the brands but just for, just for the one or two categories in, I can't imagine how to generate all those creatives so in that case uh, most likely which you'll be using in this which sounds sort of more more or less as business as usual thing you would be having uh, these creatives as a catalog so you would have catalog of all of your products with and catalogs you can set up if you have at least 100 products if you have less than 100 then there's no point of having catalogs but if you have it then uh, you are setting it up as uh, on the ad level as the creative being used and basically then the system understands if it is remarketing those products you're looking at and then they're showing those specific deals or if you're looking at fridge category then they're showing all the different fridge that you have there and if you're using that for the broad audience then the algorithm would be just looking from all of your all of your catalog for example if I'm browsing uh Facebook I see your ad uh I might be interested in whatever like uh stoves for example because I'm renovating my house at the moment and then uh they would be showing just me the stoves because they the algorithm thinks I'm interested in that if I'm actually not looking for a stove at the moment and I'm looking for the fridge then like a few days later or a few hours later I might be seeing a fridge ad from the catalog that specific audience and very hot audience already but, um, but, but in the beginning you said you have to go broad not necessarily like for the hot audience so there are two things that we can speak about one is remarketing and retargeting so for that catalog I would say is probably one of the best options you can use there because then you don't have to think about the creatives and everything else especially if you're doing like lots of products as you mentioned in your case then catalog is definitely the best thing to do on remarketing just to try to engage with those products that people are looking at if we are speaking about uh, like broad audience campaigns or they don't have to be always fully broad that you can also have some sort of limits for example if you have I don't know like only delivery in Riga you might be doing like men women age 18 to 65 for example because most likely unless you have data that there is some specific age groups that are not purchasing anything from you I wouldn't say it makes sense to have like the age targeting uh, limited there but you might be putting that it's only for Riga inhabitants and maybe plus some kilometers that that would be there and then for those campaigns so there are two ways how you can look at that one is uh the catalog sales where you have all of your products available and then you are trying to basically scoop them in with oh we have this great deal or this great product 
or the other way around is when you're creating those specific creatives, which I was speaking mainly beforehand. So you have created something uh, very particular, like we have 20% discount for everything. You might be having some influencer there, or you might be having some well-known person, and then you have created a nice video for that, like as you usually would be seeing. I think one of the cases that comes to mind uh, for me at the moment is, for example, like Vision Express, I think on a monthly basis, they have these campaigns with all of their characters that at the moment they are doing. And then we have 30% discount for glasses there. We have 15% discount for lenses here. So those should be like basically viewed as the general um, specific campaigns created for that particular audience. But at the same time, they also might be running all of their catalog sales with all the glasses they ha they're having. And then they would just appear in your timeline as a product. Would these same principles work for like uh, for small businesses who are offering services like untangible goods, okay. like use our services and uh, we will make your life easier? But they don't. They don't really. They will not buy it. And imagine the CEO does not want to give any discounts sure like discounts are just the easiest way you know to explain these sort of sensations you definitely don't have to use discounts at all times and uh quite often i'm also very much advising clients to very much think of that especially if you're uh, a producer of some kind uh, i have in my portfolio a couple of brands who are sort of not really hand making but quite similar to that with their clothes and then uh, they needed quite some time to understand what's actually the margins that they are able to spend on that so they are not not profitable which wouldn't make any sense uh, to do so that is the first thing but uh, then you wouldn't have catalog sales as a whole uh, and in that case it sort of goes together with what I was speaking previously about creatives so you have your general campaigns which are uh, as an introduction and in, and in those sort of cases it's even more important than for the like big e-commerce like 220 or minutes or whatever uh, to promote and have a proper funnel structure, meaning you might have something for awareness, or even if you don't want to do some awareness campaigns, you can have uh, traffic campaigns initially, which are bringing people to your website, and then you are remarketing those people who visited your website, for example, with even more in-depth uh, creatives and understanding. So again, don't if you know that the sales cycle will be longer in your product is more difficult to understand than the regular like consumer goods don't expect people to buy from you initially and on the first uh, go you need to warm them up you have to inform them about what you are doing and that is a thing that lots of companies are missing so basically make blogs <laughs> also that could be the case yeah but also in in in, in the ads sort of sphere as many blogs as you might have, as much of uh, like market penetration you might have, there will always be people who not know you. And then for the first level, just do the general broad overview of what you are. And then for the sales, do it a little bit later, once they at least have visited your website or have interacted in any other meaningful way. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have a question regarding the budget. Um, I represent a small business, uh, it's local, it's a boutique manor hotel. And um, actually a few years ago on Facebook and Meta, we did really well. We just posted um, yeah, photo galleries or photos and we did a little uh, boost with 20, 30 euros. And we got really like 60,000, 70,000, more than 100K impressions, hundreds of likes, uh, uh, hearts, etc. cetera. Um, last few years, especially this one is going totally totally to almost zero so so we're in kind of a struggle and of course we're looking on the creative part uh, and also the question is uh, since we've tried uh, a bit with google ads something that didn't work for us at all since it's our business is seasonal and when there is business there is when there is none there is none and we got no boost uh, during winter time so basically, my question is, uh, what's the starting budget for a campaign to run, let's say, a whole year for a hotel uh, to be reasonable and not just be wasted money because the sum is too insignificant to work? Thank I, you. I honestly, like, do you have a specific answer towards the budget question? Um, there's... Where should I... I think here. <laughs> just standing there. Yeah. Well, so when it comes to budget, you usually look at sort of baseline metrics. So you have expected CPA times 50 conversions 
times seven, which is like the quote unquote, what best practice for budgeting is now, but your business in your case is going to be very, you know, like vertical sensitive, seasonal sensitive. So it would be probably down to testing what works. Um, that would be first part. The second part would be to coming up with a multi touch point or like funnel approach as Norman's was saying. So you're probably looking to warm up some leads since you're probably competing with Airbnb bookings and everything else that is out there. Um, you probably are looking at awareness or traffic or, you know, whatever objective for campaign that brings people to your website. And then you can start thinking about how to retarget them with offers, or maybe there's um, affiliate offers that you can work with, with some entertainers in the area. Uh, if there's any seasonal, I don't know, beer gardens are opening, you know, something like that. You come up with a package deal. Uh, but when it comes to like actual budget implementation, you'll have, one company in e-com and the same one selling a similar product and their budgets are going to differ. There's no way for us to tell. So it's really about you finding a partner or um, whether it's a performance agency or you can come to HTT pool for advice. But at the end of the day, it's going to be down to testing and then perfecting that success formula. Yeah. Okay, Com thanks. Completely agree to Martin on this one. Just continue on his thought for different budgets for different companies uh, in my portfolio, two very similar clothing brands and their results in general, which both of them are very happy about are approximately three times different. Like the creatives, I would say, are the same quality, but the audience loyalty and stuff like that is in, is having a lots of different uh, uh, metrics. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's very much impacting metrics. And uh, it also goes together like there will be some campaigns that don't work, but uh, for you, it might be important to have a, uh, not only for the campaign budget optimization, which uh, makes sense, there's basically a leak on meta where you can select campaign budget optimization. And again, like unless you have to like uh, spend the budget of one of the, as in your case, it was one of the brands, for example, who wants to advertise for like thousand euros, then you are putting the campaign budget optimization and it automatically just aligns it to whichever is uh, earning the most for you and providing you the best results. But uh, this one, the automatic placements, that might be something that uh, you might be looking at. And not only well, automatic placements, they are uh, sort of explaining themselves. So unless you have a specific reason in order not to um, advertise, for example, on stories uh, or on like audience network or something, just enable everything. Even if it isn't too powerful for you and you don't get too good results in that particular platform, algorithm will be smart enough in order to understand not to show your ads there too much. And you'll be spending very small budgets, but in general, it will decrease all of the prices because if they, for example, are finding that, hey, you will look like the person that the algorithm decides that they want to show the ad, whether you are on Facebook at the moment or Instagram or somewhere else on the audience network, they might be able to serve you that particular ad and they don't have to look for you while you are free and inventory goes uh, goes away. But uh, yeah, so in your case, uh, what is uh, also important, basically the way how the algorithm works is... Uh, based on the objective that you set up for Facebook, uh, it looks for those people who are most likely to do that particular thing. So meaning uh, if you select sales objective, then to look for people who are browsing Facebook or Instagram, uh, clicking on ad, then after they're clicking on ad, they are going to your site uh, and they are doing the purchase. If you are unable to get to those 50 conversion events within one week in order to get out of the learning phase, so then there is the case as you will be putting, for example, add to cart as your main objective. So then it looks for those people who are browsing the site, clicking on ad, going to your website, adding something to cart, whether they do or don't buy, that's basically nothing that the algorithm cares about. That, that moment, it's just looking for those people. And in general, by having the right objectives, you most likely will have the better results. And the same thing also applies when you're looking at upper funnel events, like even website visits or maybe video views or something like that. If you would have just a reach campaign, for the most part, they are ineffective and there's no point of having them. But if you can have some sort of... Uh, strategy behind why you're doing that maybe you're showing video views campaigns and then uh, for those people who watched at least 50 percent of your video then you might be re-engaging them with some other offer where you're showing like maybe actual sales rates or something because again there might be those people who would be purchasing uh like booking your uh, hotel from the very get-go but there is also quite big probability as martin mentioned you need to warm them up beforehand but yeah, dynamic ads, uh, this goes for the bigger brands if you have the catalogs, as was mentioned previously. So then it makes a lot of sense. You have the catalogs on, you might be adding some of the frames, for example, at the background. 
and then you and then the system automatically can create an ad which you don't have to do on your own and then can show whichever product is the, that person most interested in as I was mentioning a little bit before and uh, this yeah goes uh, together with what I was just saying about the full funnel approach so basically whatever you are setting the algorithm to do those are the things the algorithm will do and don't expect if you're setting a sales campaign to have for example high video views uh, results or vice versa if you have video views campaigns don't expect there to be high sales result results it might happen sometimes but usually it doesn't and uh, that's something to keep an eye on so for my side for the meta performance at least very brief intro that was it uh, if you have any more questions you can ask them now or after the presentation I will hand over to Robert who will tell you a little bit more about the security part now hey guys uh yeah thank you all for uh once again for coming here uh actually what Norman said it's super super um I would say advanced information that uh, definitely we just want you to have it and just really make sure you have summarized it and uh, really just make it sink in uh, as as that's pretty much what we have been compiling for you to um, to get this knowledge here and um, we have also compiled a little bit of um, research how to how to keep your Instagram account safe why we think this is an, an important topic because we have also uh, recently um, understood that there are many many as individuals as businesses who actually ask us these questions because they have been experiencing some someone impersonating them someone trying to log in from some different location into their accounts plus we have even seen that accounts just have followers dropping then coming back and these kind of situations and it's really really important it's also one of the prerequisites for cooperating with us to to have the account actually super safe so that so that we're not experiencing any problems because that's actually where you do your business and uh, we cannot have any problems with that so moving forward yeah uh, I'm uh, I'm gonna talk about it in, in in two chapters basically just running through nine steps on how to make sure that you are keeping your, your Instagram account super safe and secure and the second topic will be on how to get support if in case you're experiencing some problems so create a strong password that's the, the that's the first one and uh, obviously change it change it uh, super regularly as well but um, as we all know it's it's not that easy uh, even even I I think all of us uh, struggle with that but yeah just keep in mind that uh, also update your uh, phone number and email uh, this is actually a pretty uh, important thing to note down uh, as as I have just recently uh discovered that um for some reason there was my old phone uh sitting in the settings of of my Instagram account and in case something happened in the future the reset password would probably go to that number so just uh, just check this and also check the email because sometimes in in our daily rush we just maybe sometimes uh, have have not updated the the old email to, to the new one uh yeah enable two-factor authentication most probably everyone has this uh once you are logging in on uh, onto the uh, Facebook business manager but yeah this is super important also for the Instagram make sure you have it uh enable login request also when you set up two-factor on authentication on Instagram you will receive with this login request you will receive an alert whenever someone tries to log into your account from a device or web browser Instagram doesn't recognize so make sure you enable this one as well yeah this is very interesting thing Instagram will never send you a DM uh why is that a important thing to note is because a lot of a lot of cases when we receive some troubleshooting and or some requests for troubleshooting we understand from them from the discovery call we understand that um there has been someone impersonating even Instagram or impersonating Facebook um, let's say support team and just reaching out to the company even even big one companies uh just reaching out impersonating them as Facebook or Instagram support team uh email looks perfectly uh even even the domain is somewhat Instagram I don't know mail or whatever something like that in again in our daily rush it looks perfect 
uh, and uh, suddenly we just uh, we just basically click on the link and we uh, I don't know type in the the information that's being requested. But yeah, keep in mind that Instagram will never send you a DM. The same applies for Facebook. Uh, yeah, and make sure your email account is secure. Anyone who can read your email can probably also access uh, your Instagram account. Log out of Instagram when you use a computer or phone you share with other people. That's also a very important thing. And never give your password to someone you don't know and trust, obviously. And also, uh, lastly but not least, think before you authorize any third-party app. Uh, yeah, just recently, again, we have experienced that through some of the apps, um, bad actors can access actually sensitive information, uh, games, some some I don't know some uh, some apps for example for uh, for making Instagram feeds uh, look nicer, creative uh, creative apps of such sort uh, from unauthorized or unknown developers can can potentially harm your um, sensitive data. Yes, and when experiencing account issues, uh, introducing Instagram.com slash hacked, uh, this is something that Instagram actually has launched, uh, well, Meta has launched uh, sort of recently. Um, we are going to explore that in a second. It looks just like this. Uh, feel free to uh, just go there through the, through the Google search or just type in the link. Uh, it's, it's actually something that Instagram is still testing out. But uh, from what we have heard, it's actually showing good results and people who have lost at that moment their access, they can actually really easy get back it through this link. Yes. So visit Instagram.com slash hacked in case you have forgotten your password, you have lost your two-factor auth authentication access, you feel that account has been disabled or there's some kind of policy violation or you think you have been hacked or impersonated. Um, so how it works, just go on the link, you'll be automatically logged or taken into a login screen. If you, if you have multiple access, multiple accounts, just use the one uh, that, uh, that you think you have been impersonated with or there's some, any other problem. And basically select the problem that you're having with your account. Yes, and uh, there's another actually uh, cool feature that's uh, being tested and actually um, I have already heard really good feedback about it that uh, you can lean on your friend's help to access your account. That um, earlier this year, Instagram started testing out a way for people to ask their friends to confirm their identity in order to help regain access to their account. And it looks just like this. Uh, from the experience that we heard, it just took a couple of minutes. It was super quick, super fast. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, you can all be assured that Instagram and Meta as a whole, as a platform, are going into the direction of making sure that accounts are super safe, and there are even extra extra features implemented to make sure that we get access back ASAP. And one more thing from my side, which I wanted to share with you guys, it's something that under HTT Pool, under Aleph uh, Aleph Group, what we build right now is and it's also one of the service levels of of uh, small and medium business team that martins normans and i represent under HTT pool is the smb incubator uh feel free anyone who has startup who has just an idea whether you are planning to start advertising in in meta or you are about to start right feel free anyone to just go on smbincubator.com register there we have created this platform uh, as a place, as an incubator, where we will be uh, teaching uh, small and medium businesses at scale. Uh, we have created three learning modules, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Plus, uh, there will be a feature of live chat support, basically anything you need to know to jumpstart your uh, meta advertising. Uh, plus, we will be also monitoring on our backend uh, how you are doing this. And potentially for the for the ones that are um, rising and advancing their uh, meta advertising endeavors, uh, potentially you will get one on one support with us uh, as performance managers. Uh, yeah, and in the future we are planning to launch this uh, this program. Also, it's currently actually launched in uh, in uh, in uh, Latvia and Lithuania, 
but we are planning to launch it um, in a uh, in couple more countries where we are based. And uh, the idea, the bigger idea is that uh, we will be constantly updating this platform with a lot of knowledge where you can basically just come learn something new, maybe learn something about some specific industry. And soon we are uh, uploading there also uh, a lot of e-commerce playbooks and just we're going to start a verticalize the topics. So yeah, thank you. That's it from Meta side. Off to polls about Twitter. Ah, yeah. Yes, I, I have one question. Interesting, maybe a bit of remark. I wanted to now like you on Facebook, HTT pool, and uh, I saw that I'm already uh, have put like, and I am following uh, you guys, but I have never seen any update from you. Never. Most of the sites I I do uh, constantly push unfollow because actually the information is not so relevant for me. So yes, this is my question regarding Meta and the algorithms has there something changed there because from my side i've seen that yeah the impressions the views they have dropped dramatically so yeah it helps us that yes they follow the yeah. 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 yeah yeah but, but i would like to 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 get the information but um yeah some something is not not coming through i don't know why i mean okay perhaps there is this, they implemented something like following and liked maybe that's there, the reason yeah actually i wanted to say about it uh you can check just you can just just do it right now i've I, i've seen even for myself that there are pages which i have just liked but i haven't really followed and there are even pages which i have apparently unfollowed following. and like yes, we have to look into that <laughs> yeah, well, it's very much depends on the fact of what you are engaging uh, as other things, how much time you're spending on the platforms and so on. So that is usually the base for it. Uh, you can quite easily see that if you are interacting with something that you usually don't, I don't know, like watching construction video, which was interesting, then most likely for the next few days, you will see tons of construction videos on your feeds. Okay. And, and that's basically how it works. And also when you are doing the targeting options and everything else, it's not only uh, those interests that you have stated on your profile, something that you are interested in, whether those are likes or, or interests in particular, but also the way how you engage with content. For example, if you have, haven't specified any languages and you're using Facebook only in Latvian and in English, but for whatever reason you're watching some videos in French, then uh, if they would be <laughs> French targeting, then uh, you would be in the French target group as well, because then the system understands that you can interact with these sort of things. and. All of these things together, they are they are combining that stuff. I, I have no idea how often some of my GT pool posts, for example, in order to speak about our case in particular, but in general, that's how that's how usually the algorithm works. Oh, but one more. Th Just a quick remark. Yeah. That, uh, I followed a few groups in Facebook where I live, and they have a lot of uh, water and stuff. And all I see is something that's happening there locally. Actually, I'm not interested in that. There's a local world. And all I see, I, I just sometimes click on it and it just shows me more and more and more. So basically, I'm using Facebook less and less and less because it's giving me crap, 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 crap. Yeah, that's, that's But it's learning actually that you are not interested, that's, that's not that's interested that's into crap, crap, crap. Nothing else you can do about it. if you want to see something that you're interested in, you have to click on it and engage in that one. That's the only way how you can uh, basically teach the algorithm. If you're asking me on my personal opinion, I also think it's way too fast. And then when you are doing some click, especially on the groups, because that's very heavily promoted, I have seen it in my pages and my, my personal timeline as well. But I assume, and I don't assume I'm sure of that, that for the most visitors, that makes the most sense. And that's how they can do the best business. Because basically, the business model is simple. The more you are staying on Facebook and Instagram and all the meta platforms, the more they are earning. So, and, and and that means that at least for the general people, it will be working like that. Even before Elon's uh, takeover on Twitter, you can very much see that the, even then, like negative news were very much outplaying, at least in my timeline, the positive ones. And uh, there were, even before the takeover, there were so many people who I don't follow and I was just seeing them on the timeline. That again, it just creates engagement. And the more engagement you have in various places, that's what is shown to you rather than something that has a very small part of the engagement. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Pauls. And yeah, I'm working with a platform called Twitter, which uh, everyone thought was dying and uh, was very negative and now suddenly became interesting. Uh, so yeah, my, my 
just for yeah talks not so much maybe about the best practices and uh, let's say that area because i think nowadays all the social media platforms are moving in the same direction like uh, either go the same go broad or, or how creatives work and all that so i'll just maybe go over some of the topics like let's say why somebody would even look at twitter as an advertising platform or like why why would they choose, choose these potentially tier two platforms or anything like that as well as maybe briefly something around the analytics and that area yeah, so basically I, I'm overseeing, let's say, the performance unit in our company. So our, our team is the one which is running the, let's say, largest global advertisers that want to run on Twitter uh, ads. Uh, these are various names from, let's say, various verticals and et cetera. Um, so yeah, uh, basically, let's say if, if something is happening, which is relatively large on Twitter, typically that goes to our team. And this is, let's say, this performance segment, which I am covering. Um, so yeah, maybe just to start off for those who are a bit less into advertising, I wanted to also cover the topic of this like branding versus performance or upper or lower funnels. So yeah, the, the area we focus more on is this uh, performance marketing. Uh, again, 100 websites will give you 100 different answers, but in very generic terms, it's uh, when we are able, let's say, to measure the results of our actions in the, let's say, either day one or day seven, and basically see the outcome of our ads in terms of, typically in terms of revenue, uh, and make changes adapt, adapting depending on that rather than just pushing out ads to everyone and hoping something happens. Um, so yeah, uh, I tried to sort of sort of like outline maybe the differences between typical branding ads and more performance ads. So typically, let's say when we are working on something that uh, this is the, for the most part, I would say campaigns that are always on campaigns. It's these evergreen content when you're running something year round and the as long as things work, basically you keep on work, uh, running with them rather than let's say these seasonal campaigns where you have typically like a fixed fixed budget, fixed period of runtime, fixed creatives, all of this. So yeah, this is the, let's say the flexible part of uh, advertising, so to say, where we are able to, let's say, maybe disregard best practices sometime and work more on this testing approach and seeing what works and basically sticking to what actually is able to deliver the, the outcome we're looking for. Um, so yeah. We're typically working more on this right side where typically we there is a lot more flexibility on the target audience where we also work on this let's say broad campaigns fully or or are able to let's say understand in which cases do we need to go a bit further in or let's say disregard what the platform say is best to do um yeah and typically also for every company of course that it really differs on how you're splitting the budgets between one or the other like uh, i think typically like most of them are somewhere in between that either between 40 to 60 percent uh, go to one or another. Of course, it differs by industry, by by brand. Where, like, typically B two B companies might be spending more on this branding side, where you might just not be able to, let's say, convince the clients early enough what your company does or why you're useful to them. While for maybe e commerce, this could can be almost purely performance campaigns, where you're just, let's say, making sure that you get the sale on day one, and that's it. Um, so yeah, uh, just one example, maybe from from Twitter, how it would look like. So. Let's say when Avatar was promoting, so on the left side, you would have a typical, let's say, this branding campaign where you just push to, let's say, all of US that, hey, this movie is coming out, and you're focusing just on how many people see the ad, and that's it. And on the other side, basically, you would have this tip, maybe something more on the performance side where you see that there's a ticket sale link, you're probably tracking if the user purchases it or not, and basically just adapting day to day whether the campaign is still profitable or not. Um, yeah, so... About Twitter, let's say, what's uh, what is the Twitter's audience or what people are doing there? Um, as I said, like nowadays, I think when you maybe you're, when you're a smaller company, it's most useful that you're just starting off with the bigger platforms like Google, like Meta, etc. But yeah, once once you are growing a bit more and uh, let's say you understand that you want to reach your users also from other areas, that's when you start to think about, okay, maybe I could start putting my budget in somewhere else as well. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a bit maybe about Twitter specifically, their audience, and uh, let's say. What, what would be the use cases, let's say, when you could start to think about that and maybe just some of the things you could, let's say, think about when you're deciding the platform choice. Um, yeah, so if you look at the user standpoint and let's say what typically happens on the platform and what is the common, let's say, user persona, you could say then uh, Twitter is the place where they want to be this like uh, what's happening now, basically what's happening, in, let's say, some kind of events uh, when some kind of, let's say, I don't know the World Cup was going on. Twitter was the place to be to follow. Whether you're, I don't know, gambling based on that, whether you're just looking for the scores, it can be anything around that. But like Twitter's superpower is that the users are there for this live content specifically, and that's something you're not probably going to find anywhere. 
the same is also with uh, news, for example, that like even though the platform's audience size might not be the biggest, most of the news are still using Twitter screenshots, and that's the place where this content usually originates. Um, so yeah, that's also the difference in how people are usually on the platforms. If it's Twitter's not a platform like Instagram, where most of it is selfies and how cool you look, but it's a place where everyone's a wannabe influencer and how they're, how they're important. And this is maybe why there is this perception of this negative platform, because whenever there is critique, it's probably going to start off from Twitter. But at the same time, also from a business standpoint, uh, of course, it's going to be a bit better when you're there also communicating and able to control in which direction this critique goes, because at the end of the day, the bad publicity is going to happen anyways. It's just whether you are able to influence it or not. So yeah, uh, as I said, Twitter is the place where everyone's special. <laughs> so yeah, uh, if we're looking at the way how sort of the platform, let's say when it's the most used and when it's most important, as I said, it's very huge during live events. And this is one place where, let's say, if you're running these more like awareness or branding ads, if there is some kind of, let's say, trend, whether it's, I don't know, pride uh, or, or let's say some kind of Christmas, for example, these are the places where most of the con conversation, let's say, on what kind of gifts you're going to buy your significant other could be showing up. And that's where, as you can see, like Twitter is typically the most common place where media companies also get their articles or information for their articles. Um, so this is one thing. Uh, yeah, just an example for uh, like how Pepsi used also Twitter to, to cause some, let's say, awareness around their own quiz, uh, Christmas campaigns and uh, posted content around that. And uh, Again, that's a place where there's a lot of content. So if we're looking at this, like how much posts you're doing per day, then Twitter is somewhere up at the top there, that there is, let's say, a lot of clutter in that sense. And uh, as a brand, like you can push, let's say, a lot of different opinions out, a lot of different stories uh, around these type of content you're trying to do. Um, so I mentioned also World Cup, as I said, like for a dying platform, it's still a pretty big place to be for all of this. And uh like this is uh, also like if we're looking historically, I think there was one point in time when I think Apple was doing their launch events only on Twitter just because of the way how you can get the snowball effect they're rolling and basically get your news from Twitter to also other areas. So yeah, uh, if there are any live events or something like this, that's basically one of the ways how you could utilize the platform, let's say for live streams, for example, these uh, spaces they now have and different kind of other areas there. So yeah. These launch events, basically, this is the go-to way how to, let's say, do a launch that you started with Twitter, and then you can supplement it with other channels as well. And launches that usually happen, let's say, when you're advertising your Twitter, typically also, have, let's say, are easier to get viral rather than just doing it on other platforms. Uh, and again, like as I said, everyone wants to be special there, so everyone's uh, typically listening to the opinions of others also, and uh, the typical user there is... Uh, let's say on average has more money and on average also wants to listen to others who's, who are saying your product is, let's say, good or bad or whatever. This is why the opinion of a user there relatively also matters from an advertiser standpoint. Uh, so yeah, maybe just to some, some of the things that people have been talking about, especially lately. Uh, so again, I think everyone's been posting how Twitter is dying. This is, I think, a very common thing every two to three years, uh, not just now. And uh, if we're just looking from the pure like user standpoint, as I said, it might not be, of course, the Meta or Google or et cetera, but uh, just from pure audience uh, size, it's still increasing. And I think and, and to some extent, Elon's existence also helps to that. Uh, of course, there's a lot of polarizing opinions around that, but anyways, negative publicity still brings users there, there to the platform. And in the long term, that benefits the, let's say the way how you as an advertiser can increase the amount of users you can serve in a given time or in a given country. Um, the other thing, of course, is as I said, this, uh, if you're a very brand centric, let's say company, that you don't want to publish your content in a place where you, the tweet above you or below you could be something that could be detrimental to your brand. And uh, uh, again, it's hard to say about the algorithm because at the end, end of the day, it's a black box to everyone. But uh, if we're looking purely at just the hate speech, uh, Twitter is now trying to, of course, work together with various third-party, let's say, verification companies to show that it's not just them saying that their company is good in terms of the content, but it's also others uh, basically verifying that. And aside from, let's say, this uh, spike of hate speech just when Elon took over, nowadays it's actually lower than it was before, uh, let's say, pre-takeover. Um, so yeah, uh, on the long term, of course, they want to be this, let's say, global town square where people are able to 
uh, speak about anything both the left and the right. And uh, there's equal amounts of people who like something as there is ha uh, hating it maybe in that sense, uh, but making sure that there's policy going around that, uh, let's say they're they're able to control only the hateful speech, hateful content, uh, but at the same time, let's say allowing this negative area also to exist on the platform without being overly, let's say removing of content. And uh, yeah, I know there's a lot of, of course, uh, posts saying otherwise, but that's an area, of course, they're still working on and uh, most likely will basically yeah, improve in the future. Uh, yeah, as mentioned, I think everyone's also heard the news about how many people they have fired by now. And uh, I think this is a very common thing in Elon's company is that like uh, he's very product centric and he wants to make sure that it's a, let's say, platform that works more on the product side rather than on the support side. And I think this is more or less the same, but always with Tesla also, where there's pretty much non-existent support, but it was solely focused on the product to make sure that maybe not now, but in a year's time, uh, basically just because of how it's beneficial to the content creators, beneficial to users on the platform, and that you're actually seeing stuff you want to see, that people would then come to Twitter and basically the, the product would sell itself rather than there's, let's say, the support team behind it who's trying to operate. And yeah, uh, they are embracing public testing. It's a lot more startupy now, you could say. So a lot of this fuck around and find out mentality. And uh, there is, of course, a lot of things that are going to be going by or that are testing and scrapping a week later. But at the end of the day, depending on the results and depending on the user's feedback, at least we do see that in the long term, it's going to be better. Maybe not in the closest months, six months, but over time. So yeah, uh, and as from a user standpoint, uh, like user side standpoint, as I mentioned, uh, what they're tracking as a main metric, for example, is this monetizable daily active user count. Uh, and from an advertiser standpoint, so this is around 250 million globally. Uh, I think the monthly active user count was around 400 million, four to 450, something like that. And uh, at the same time, if we're looking just at the local market, for example, in Latvia also, it's been, I think now it's something around between 200 and 250,000 users. Uh, but if we compare that to like two years ago, when they just started, let's say, showing their audience size in the ads managers, I think then it was around 150,000, something like this. So the increase is also on a local level as well. Um, so yeah, this is more or less about the the audience and let's say Twitter in general. Uh, but yeah, as I said, from an advertiser standpoint, let's say, if you're thinking about should or should I not, let's say, think about going into this tier two platform in a sense, uh, then maybe I just uh, wanted to sort of go through some of the points on uh, some of the cases, let's say, what to consider when you're, when you're in general thinking about, let's say, involving another platform. Uh, so yeah, uh, if we're looking at Twitter, as I said, like it might not be meta when it comes to the algorithms, but its core point still is the, the audience quality. So it, let's say when we are targeting, for example, broad, we might not, the, the platform might not be the best at understanding maybe which user is going to purchase. But if you find a user who is purchasing, typically those are people who are willing to purchase more. And this is what we've seen also across various verticals. But let's say if you're an app, for example, if you're a freemium game that sells, let's say products within the game, we might see that it might cost more than other platforms if we're looking at, let's say, just the install costs. But over time, let's say over a year's period, over two years period, these people who installed from Twitter are actually spending more within the game. And this is one thing also to consider when you're, let's say, comparing how other platforms are performing, that you need to be looking at various things, not just the upper or lower form metrics, but also the lifetime values of the users and uh, look at it on, on a bit deeper level, let's say, on, on country level, on demographic level, et cetera. Uh, again, I, in terms of the audiences, as I said, it's not maybe the biggest globally, but there are some specific markets, for example, where Twitter is also either comparative to Meta or even bigger than Meta. For example, with Japan, where I think it's the sec uh, second or third largest, basically, social media platform, depending on what you count as a platform there. Um, so yeah, but yeah, the biggest sort of issues from an advertiser standpoint still there are that, let's say when it comes to the optimization, it's not, let's say there in terms of how good the pixel, for example, is, or from an app standpoint, we still only can, let's say, optimize for installs for the most part. And for now, like for now, they just recently, let's say launched that for Android, for example, we can optimize on purchases for iOS. It's set to release also soon. Uh, yeah, and as I said, like because of these issues, let's say from the pixel or from the in-app browser, we do see that like the difference from what Twitter, for example, shows in the data and what other third-party platforms like Google Analytics or mobile measurement platforms shows. Typically, this difference, let's say, is a bit bigger than with other platforms. 
And the general advice basically uh, anyways is to give uh, all the way how Twitter can try to collect the data, but at the end of the day, look at, let's say, what is your unified source of data like Google Analytics, like uh, let's say AppsFly or something like that if you have an app, and then base your data off of there. Uh, so just to disregard all the discrepancies. Uh, so yeah, if you are an advertiser, let's say if you're just running Meta, uh, typically the most of the benefits you can get out of Twitter are just that, uh, as I said, like at the end of the day, if you if all of your eggs are in one basket, uh, sooner or later, maybe some algorithm change might not so much benefit you. Uh, and this is why also it's always wise that if you are going into these larger ad spends, that you start thinking about also trying to basically capture the budgets between the various platforms just to make sure that if uh, either policies impact you or algorithms impact you, that you're overall, let's say, not as uh, impacted by it. And if you have some previous, at least, experience on these platforms, then at least you know what works and what doesn't for you specifically, disregarding all those best practices. Um, yeah, again, as I said, like the once you're, let's say, more or less like a bigger player in the market also, and you think that you've captured most of your audience on, for example, Facebook, and uh, things start getting quite expensive for you, that's also the moment where you, where you can also get some additional percentage of new users in a way in a new platform, uh, basically in a different way and uh, try to approach them through that. And uh, it's not just that, but also that once your ads are across multiple platforms, it's easier, let's say the user sees a user that overlaps between multiple platforms that they see your ads more times or, or quicker. And that also leads to the purchase happening typically quicker. So just an example, like if we're looking at how many people from which platform use what, uh, like I know how much can be seen, but for example, if we're comparing Twitter to Facebook, then like you can see that around 87% of Twitter users are not actually using Facebook. So if you're using that as a baseline metric for your budget, then Twitter is a way how you can still get like additional, let's say audience that you wouldn't be able to get elsewhere. So this is why also it's good to, let's say, not have all of your eggs in one basket. Uh, yeah, so probably this will be sent somewhere afterwards and it's going to be easier to find, but uh, normally all of this data is, can be found online and let's say if you want to find it, you can always relatively easily get it. Uh, yeah, so as I said, like uh, it depends, of course, market by market, uh, but let's say in some of the uh, some of the areas, for example, in Japan, Twitter is actually one of the biggest sort of social media platforms, and if you are targeting some, let's say globally, for example, you, you should be able to, let's say, to find specific market segments where different platforms are, let's say, performing differently. So there's a couple of things that you need to take into account always. Uh, it's, it's the market, for example. It's how, let's say, also that you need to adapt your product there. So if you're an e-commerce, let's say, uh, company, then you might need to know in which country people usually pay by, by credit card, where they pay by bank transfer, and uh, make sure that you adapt your strategy based on the platform, based on your how, how people, let's say, perceive, for example, the creative and try to, let's say, you can always find the ways uh, what you can test in that sense. Uh, and uh, the last thing I said is, yeah, once you're advertising more places than typically, this leads to users making the decision faster. So it, this is just from Twitter internal data, like from Twitter specifically, let's say if you're running multiple formats, uh, so let's say running these branding campaigns, running lower funnel ads, trying to get an install or a purchase or something like that then basically once you're running these multiple formats, then people are, let's say, are not uh, able to, let's say in their minds, skip this ads as quickly. And they're able to basically, uh, they're able to, their ad recall increases once they're seeing these multiple formats. And uh, the same in a sense could be applied when you're looking at multiple platforms at the same time. So if uh, you as a user see an ad, let's say once in one format in Twitter, once on Facebook, once on Instagram, you're more likely to remember also the brand behind it and more likely to make this final decision. And uh, this is also based off of the studies that regardless if you're focusing on lower or upper funnel, the basically the, the quick, the more times a person sees the ads, there's the larger chance that this decision is made. Typically, normally this decision is made between two to three times of an ad being seen. And if you can make sure that, let's say a user sees these ads two to three times let's say this two to three time frequencies uh, reached faster to multiple platforms that can also benefit uh, your business as well. Uh, so yeah, so see, these are some of the things maybe if we're talking about the, the future focus of the platform or Twitter 2.0, how, uh, how they call it. Uh, again, the biggest thing for them is to, to make sure now that they're transparent and trying to rebuild the trust. And most of the focus for them also as a company is specifically to focus on being this town square of, uh, of information, being uh, this place where 
uh, people can actually trust, let's say, what the company is saying. And uh, this is also their, their ambition to not only be a platform which is good for the users, but also in the long term that Creator has a product that works, actually, let's say, which, which hasn't been the case for a lot of the times previously. Uh, especially, yeah, as I said, that we are working specifically on this performance segment and Twitter's, let's say, this, this revenue split, for example, is around 85% branding. So most of the Coca-Colas, et cetera, were typically there. But you couldn't see, let's say, a lot of e-commerce, for example, companies advertising on Twitter. And this is what they want to change in the long term. Uh, yeah, so as I said, uh, this fuck around and find out mentality, they are testing like a lot of products now. And products actually are moving and shipping faster with these smaller teams. It's just that this typically this advertiser or support from the platform is a bit more limited now. So the, the goal is that in the long term, it's able to be a platform that's selling itself. It's able to test, uh, let's say, and, and based off of the user's feedback, also make changes to their platform. Like one example was that they actually published more or less their, uh, their source code for their the way how they're showing this For You page. And uh, yeah, now it also specifically with less developers, that's a way how they're able to understand from the users actually and uh, get their input to fix the uh, pro to fix basically the platform faster and understand what doesn't work or implement changes on a week-to-week -week basis rather than from quarter to, to quarter. And uh, yeah, and, and this of course goes through all sides of it, not just, uh, not just the, the user side from an advertiser, let's say point, they, they wanna make sure that there's more products that actually look like uh, people want to uh, click on the ads, uh, which uh, let's say if we're comparing to other platforms like TikTok, which have grown recently, like. The most part, let's say, from there is that you have the, the most, let's say, options as an advertiser to express your brand creatively. And this is something that Twitter was having, let's say, limited the options before. So having more, let's say, uh, more formats you can use, more ways to, let's say, exclude content that's uh, hateful for your brand, for example, next to your ads, as well as um, having more tools basically to make sure that they, it's actually not as complicated to make campaigns on Twitter. So yeah, as I said, what TikTok, for example, was doing previously just to make sure it's easy for the advertisers is that they were copying more or less some of the areas they liked from Meta just to make sure it works. And then now at this stage, for example, Twitter's ads UI isn't the most user intuitive, you could say. It's a lot different than the others. And it's not really beneficial for, uh, let's say, you as a new advertiser to start advertising because there's these hurdles you need to pass just to understand which button to click. So yeah, this is something they're working on from that side. Uh, again, the other side is uh, the relevance. So aside from the algorithms or targeting, uh, they want to focus on making sure that, first of all, the organic content is something that people actually want to see, what fits their agenda, basically. And then afterwards, based on this, once they understand how relevancy works, that you are able also to target this uh, from a performance standpoint. So yeah, uh, basically a lot more on the format side and then the optimization to make sure it's actually a decent performance product, as well as working with third-party integrations to both show that they are a safe platform as well as to have more, let's say, uh, options of what you can do as an advertiser. Um, yeah, and maybe one topic I wanted to briefly touch upon is also that uh, now I think uh, this analytics reporting area is something that maybe can be covered in one or two hours, but just to briefly maybe touch upon like, the hurdles people are facing now, at least in the last couple of years uh, after iOS 14 or, or in general, how the most of the browsers, for example, are moving in this, let's say, cookie world. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to maybe briefly touch upon this. Uh, so, yeah, typically in the last couple of years, if we compare to how we were as advertisers moving maybe five years ago or seven years ago, it was very easy to retarget. It was very easy to find your customer and push them more content because you had their a unique ID of their phone. You were able to target them easily as in, uh, from your website's point of view. And uh, now at least with the latest changes from uh, from what Apple did with the StoreKit ad network or SK ad network, this made it a lot more complicated for us as advertisers to be able to find what kind of user you're basically targeting to and afterwards show your ads to exactly those users rather than a generic cohort of people of that interest. Um, second to that also is that uh, basically we, we need to know that this privacy centric approach that people are, that all these media companies are taking is here to stay. It's going to most likely just get worse uh, and it's not going to be easier for us to make sure our ads are shown to the, to the right person. And this, of course, is, makes it even more confusing to us as users that we're seeing maybe more irrelevant ads. And, uh, but this is just something we need to cautiously and, and continuously look at, like what we can do to 
optimize how we're making our data flow, how we are targeting, how what kind of data we are collecting, and uh, adjust our strategies based off of that. And that uh, so we need to know also that all these latest changes do have effects both not only if you're promoting an app, but also if you are promoting uh, any kind of website products. Uh, so for example, like with GDPR, you might not be able to collect most of the data now uh, unless the user consents to your cookies, basically. And uh, yeah, of course, as I said, like the main thing for us, I think now as advertisers is just to understand what are the implications of all of this, that all of this exists and just try to understand what we can impact and what we cannot. So yeah, there are some things, of course, we can do, like uh, working with conversion API, for example, to get more data back to the platform so that they can optimize better. Because uh, a lot of the companies were actually impacted by these new changes that suddenly they couldn't track their users a year in advance, or suddenly they couldn't understand, let's say, that if they're if somebody signs up for a gambling site, if they're going to pay off in two years or not. So this imposed a lot of limitations there, which we can try to offset at least on making sure we're fully there from a technological standpoint that we're pushing data back to the platforms uh, or utilizing some kind of different workflows to, to get the user there. Uh, yeah, so the main challenge, as I said, that there's actually quite a lot of things that were impacting us lately, like uh, some of them being this uh, GDPR or the Act in California that limited what kind of, uh, that limited basically user data collection without us uh, having, let's say, this uh, cookie banner on their sites. And now, for example, normally at least, if, if users don't click on these cookie banners, then we aren't able to get the pixels running. We aren't able to get the data back to the platforms. And at the end of the day, this will impact us uh, in terms of how the platform is able to optimize. So we might be running broad, but for some of the users, we might just not have the data to normally understand what are their interests or optimize based off of that. Again, the change with iOS and what, what they were doing was that uh, it made it a lot harder for us uh, for, for the app standpoint that we are not able anymore to get specific, uh, let's say, data on which specific user, which specific uh, phone uh, was, let's say, in a campaign that give, gave us a purchase or gave us uh, some kind of return on ad spend. And uh, now we are, are having to, let's say, look into these workarounds and how we're changing our user acquisition strategies, how we're changing our approaches to how we're measuring performance and then this is just something we need to look into what are our options and of course like uh in the long term there's going to be a, more and more coming to this like with the ad blockers being more popular we're just not going to be able to let's say maybe reach uh, enough users on some specific sites or with cookie depre deprecation we might not be able to let's say get more data from third parties and and let's say base our interests and base everything off of these uh cookies yeah I think last I heard was something or I need to check. Of course, it depends country by country, but I think I heard something like 10, between 10 to 20%. Yeah, I can double check this right afterwards, but typically I think it was something like that. But I would, of course, yeah, this is probably going to be increasing over time. Yeah. Maybe you can, you can pass over that. So my question is regarding Twitter. Uh, yeah. I, the question is, in which cases would you use uh, Twitter and in which case, cases would you use uh, Reddit for advertising and do you maybe have experience with Reddit? Well, Reddit is still very fresh. So it, like uh, we're, we're also recently only started partnering with Reddit and they, they released their whole like ads ecosystem, I think only in the last year or so. So at this stage, it's very hard to tell still what, what works and what doesn't there. Uh, yeah. They speak on the one of the working with Reddit, basically, there, it is some of the performance campaigns is mainly um, easy to use and quick use consumer goods, as well as something that you need very specific audience, because basically Reddit is priding itself on being sort of the place where communities are gathering. So sort of the way that Twitter is doing, but more on like positive side, yeah. putting it like that and with more uh, narrow interests. So if you have something either super broad or something super specific that that's a place where you can go but if you want to have like big performance campaigns will not be working nicely there yeah and with with twitter basically so if if, it's, if you're focusing more on top funnel like branding campaigns then i would say the the best use cases as i said are for these like live events for example if you're running a live stream and promoting that if you're associating your campaigns with uh I don't know, like Black Friday March Madness whatever kind of like these topics where people start to generate uh, their talk about um, so that would be one area, let's say, if it's branding focused. Uh, 
and then uh like in general i would say like uh, it, as a platform it's relatively typically for branding it's most used i would say by all the let's say most common as i said these coca-colas or more typical brands uh that are usually running this like auto automotive industry companies uh so this uh, customer priced goods um Basically, I would, I would say in that side, it's more or less similar to what performs on other platforms. If we're looking at performance, then this is a bit more complicated topic. So yeah, uh, historically, we were seeing that uh, typically, I would say apps were working uh, a lot better than the web websites, first of all, uh, if we're comparing the product. Um, next thing is then if we were looking at more on the verticals. So for example, we have seen uh, that, so FinTech usually worked really well, FinTech, crypto, all of this. Uh, again, uh, if we're looking at the audiences, for example, Twitter might be one of the small, more on the smaller side. But if you're looking, for example, at people in crypto, then typically that's the place where people go. So yeah, uh, it depends, of course, on the audience for your product. Uh, so yeah, vertical specific, I would say, uh, for example, FinTech uh, apps that are focused, let's say, on food delivery, mobility, like taxis, scooters, these type of things tend to work really well. Um, aside from that, uh, so if we're looking at gaming, for example, then uh, this would be only like mid-core to hardcore games because, yeah, the CPIs aren't typically the cheapest. So hyper-casual or hi casual games aren't, let's say, the most running there. Uh, so yeah, games, that, stuff like that. Basically, if we're looking at generally like how to approach, I would say like it works best for those products which are, let's say, fitting a broader audience. So this is why all these like, for example, health and fitness also, the, like as that can be uh, more or less like targeted just by demographic and globally, and, and then they run also, because more or less anybody could fall in the group. Um, so yeah, either let's say products that could be targeted where you like to broader audiences, or uh, uh, the other area would be, as, a, as I mentioned, these fintechs, for example, just because it might take uh, it, let's say more, a user might be more expensive to onboard to get either signed up or installed or whatever, but afterwards, let's say they typically deposit, for example, more in the app. So something that has a, let's say, higher price point attached to it uh, also luxury for example because of that so yeah i would say all the like uh pro basically product fit how big is your audience like what's the th your target persona uh and then uh yeah it depends i would say like historically like all the time apps used to work better a lot now they are focusing this year a lot more on e-commerce so we are finally starting to see let's say the first cases of uh like drop shipping and e-commerce that is working but uh, realistically, I would give it like half a year or more. And I think the focus will switch from app to web, probably. Yeah, something like that. Uh, so yeah, uh, what all of these changes mean for us uh, on the business side? Again, as I mentioned, now we're receiving a lot less data back to us. So we're, no, we're not able to, let's say, optimize as smoothly. And we're also sending the data, uh, the platforms like Facebook and Twitter, a lot less data for them to optimize. And this might mean that now we're not able to, let's say, find our target audience as easily just because the narrow audiences we were previously using just don't get the data they previously got to optimize on. And this, this is actually why partially all these platforms are moving to this broad targeting because then they just get more, more of these clicks. They're able to get more high-level data. And then you're able to optimize a lot more based on, uh, based on interests and stuff like that. And first-party uh, first party data, for example, that Meta or Twitter has. Um, Again, this this also would definitely impact on when it comes to your, for example, budget alignments. As I said, like previously, we were a lot more easier. It was a lot easier, let's say, to measure a user and what they're going to do one year from now. Now, typically, we can only normally see what they're going to do in the next three to seven days. And uh, tip, let's say if you were in an industry, for example, like these like hardcore games or gambling, where you typically got your investment back maybe in a year, now it's a lot less less easy let's say to, to manage your campaigns because you can't wait for a year to understand if they work or not um and yeah this this basically impacts all of our modeling we were able to do so now let's say if we were previously looking let's say at day day 30 day like one year cohorts to understand if your campaign today will be profitable in the year or not then uh, now we need to see now we basically need to set a lot more data points in this first, let's say, weeks, for example, area to understand if your campaigns are going to be profitable long term or not. And uh, yeah, we have a lot less uh, influence on what ha was happening in the short term, because, for example, with iOS, we're not able to, let's say, get the purchases immediately or see them now. We only get them in one to two days, for example, and that limits on what kind of changes we can make to our campaigns on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, to maybe explain a bit more, for example, on the app side, so what this app tracking transparency or this framework uh, did to us was that uh, now 
basically, for example, if you are showing ads on Twitter, then uh, users would get this uh, notification whether they want these personalized ads, both uh, for the Twitter app as well as for your app. So there's a two-step process involved. And in the chain, in this case where a user says that, no, they don't want to see that either for Twitter, for example, or the, uh, your app, then in this case, we're not going to get the, the amount of data we previously got. I uh, haven't checked the numbers now, but like previously, at least only 10%, I think, of the users were, were in that bucket, which opted into both. So for these 10%, we could optimally retarget them. We could optimally show them specific ads based on what they were doing. But for the remaining 90%, we could only get it probably on uh, in very limited way. We could get it, let's say, on campaign level rather than user level. And this uh, very limits like what kind of retargeting, for example, do or get the most bang for our buck in those cases. So yeah, this, this changed a lot, not only how the platforms are adapting their algorithms, but also, also for you as an advertiser on what kind of data you can see. Uh, yeah, so what, what's now happening basically for the users who are opting out, for example, who do say no for one of these, is that now uh, there's uh, iOS has set up this, as I said, this uh, StoreKit ad network or SK ad network, which is their system of basically sending back to the platform that, for example, this campaign, this campaign ID uh, got a conversion value of X. So this X is basically a number from zero to 63. And which this which identifies like what kind of action this was. So you can set this up, for example, that it was like a like open the install the app plus made a sign up plus made a purchase or whatever, and it only will send you this final number. So you're not going to see if a user, let's say, added to cart five times or or made a change like six times. You're only going to see that uh, this is the value you have set and this is the final value you're, you received. So there's a lot more, let's say, a uh, lot less visibility on what uh, the users are actually doing within the app which means that typically we need to adapt our strategies and adapt our KPIs to be able to measure our return on ad spend a lot more efficiently. And uh, then in these mobile measurement platforms or these third-party platforms where we are collecting data from, let's say, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, just to make sure you're, you're, let's say, seeing the full picture, then this is where we're trying to look at estimates on what we can actually do. Um, so yeah, well, what we can consider, for example, in these kind of cases and what others have been doing is, let's say, switching from an app-centric model to focusing on the web, or for example, to running these uh, web funnels where instead of leading users to the app store, you're leading users, let's say, to a product page or to a website where then they are asked to download the app. So we're basically making up different like ways or different funnels for the users uh, just to be able to, to optimize on what's happening there. So yeah, uh, what you can do, what you can do, and what you should always look like and look at in those cases. So if you're focusing on on just the app, then make sure you have folks, you have all the latest SDKs, you have all the latest, basically ways how the platform can get the most data and how they can optimize this. Make sure you have, for example, for iOS these uh, conversion values mapped out, so you know like the most, let's say that the most important metrics you're focusing on that you're actually able to at least track them even let's say in this three day period or the seven day period, depending on how your business works. And uh, of course, understanding how each of these platforms handle this, because uh, yeah, each platform might have some differences maybe in how this was implemented there, or how this data is ap applicable within the platform. Uh, so yeah, and the uh, same thing more or less also for the website that basically we need to make sure, understand that now we are not able to normally retarget all those users who didn't uh, approve the cookies or uh, we might not be able, let's say, to show our ads to everyone who had an ad blocker. So we might look into basically a variation of how we are pushing our content over to the users. So let's say having both an app and the web, for example, or, or just cloning, let's say, your website to an app is one example, to just be able to have more touch points where you can reach the user. Uh, and yeah, as more sort of advanced solutions, if you have, let's say, the technical capabilities, one thing is always uh, this conversion API, just to be able to push, let's say from your internal servers data to Facebook or Twitter so that they have more information they can optimize on. And uh, from the app side also, that you have these uh, various solutions aside from just what Twitter or Facebook provides, which are able to basically in a more advanced uh, way, add some tracking that you previously might not have had. Uh, so yeah, one example like uh, that was previously, I think for us from conversion API that, uh, Basically, the day, uh, Facebook, for example, here was just from the pixel receiving something like 350 uh, conversions. However, just on, by having this conversion API on top and pushing more data from 
from the servers of the client, uh, basically they were able to double the data that Facebook has and in thus way also optimize their campaigns. They had more data points to basically focus on. So yeah, now uh, with this also with these uh, through, through these like these type of ways, which are a bit more advanced solutions, maybe and a bit more harder to set up, at least you can try to negate the impact which was uh, made by all these changes that are happening. Uh, so yeah, one example, as I mentioned, is this web to app, for example, uh, where you might be, let's say, even if you have an app product that you're making a landing page where you are then, uh, optimizing for web conversions, for example, and then, uh, tracking basically based on what's happening on this landing page. And afterwards, uh, for example, in your app, trying to associate that maybe with some kind of data that's being passed over from the website. So yeah, tip, this would be one example from Facebook, like, uh, that you have your, conversion campaign running for websites instead of apps, you have your uh, uh, your sort of web page, which then leads to an app store only. And then whenever somebody makes something within the app, then you're passing over the, the information basically through this conversion API over to Facebook. So uh, I think here were some examples like how this looks like. So you have your first uh, way that user clicks on the ad on Facebook, for example, you have the pixel then on the website, which is more or less like a clone version of the of the uh, app store page and then one there you are at least able to track what happens on your previous website and once uh, the user opens your app and uh, basically does everything there uh, through the basically the app servers we at least can push a bit more extra data uh, that we would normally be able to push through the regular method let's say of running app campaigns and pushing users directly to the app so yeah as I said there's a lot of things happening we for us the most important thing is just to follow what's going on and understanding what are the business implications, what are the tests we can do, and based on that, adapt our strategy. Thanks. Carlos. Uh, if any questions for any one of us, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can come. <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah. Ask questions to the people on Please do. Uh, one thing that I remembered when Paul was speaking beforehand as well regarding advertising on numerous platforms it makes a lot of sense as well as understanding your business and knowing what you need. Uh, one of my one of my bigger clients is a company that is B two B sales and they are doing uh, quite specific B two B sales in the U S market uh, mainly. And for them, LinkedIn is by far the best platform. But as you might know, LinkedIn is super expensive for conversion campaigns. So basically, we created the strategy with them where they are doing most of the traffic on LinkedIn. And then we are remarketing them on Facebook because most of the C-level people who they need and those highly specialized people who it would be super difficult to target the, by default, then on uh, Met platforms, they have a field day then working with those sort of people. So it, it makes a lot of sense to also understand your audience and, and the place where you can find them. Yeah, and on top of that, especially in those cases, I think the biggest thing is also once you are implementing these multiple platforms, it's going to be a lot more harder for you to see which which person actually came from which platform and attribute the revenues correctly. And this is why this is where typically, for example, for apps, why we have those third party platforms which have their own like uh, basically data input into into the app just to be able to give a correct unified view. Because uh, for example, Facebook of course doesn't see what happened on Twitter. Or Twitter doesn't see what happens on Facebook, and that's why everyone, both of them, let's say, could be over-reporting their data. Because, uh, like, you're only going to see the last touch point, basically. So if a user would click on an ad on Twitter, go out of it, then go to Facebook, click on an ad there and install, both Twitter and Facebook itself would probably attribute the install to themselves because they saw that, okay, a user was on our platform, they did an action, and the install happened. Uh, but they don't see the full picture, and this is why all these third-party platforms are necessary uh, first of all, because not always we want to trust just uh, what the platform reports itself, and we want to have a secondhand expert opinion right next to it. Another important thing to keep an eye on these sort of situations is unless you have very strict board or someone else who doesn't really trust them, then you need to like assign budget to that particular platform and then try to cut everything else as much as possible. Basically, if you're investing more and you're earning more than you are investing in various platforms, then keep on doing that. You can do various experiments, meaning on how much you're spending on each of the platforms, but it, it just makes sense to do it rather than trying to pinpoint like uh, which of the cents actually gave me the results here or there. Yeah, but for the most part, I would say like when you're just starting off, I'd say like the Facebook and Google typically are the ones that work for everyone. And then uh, once you get into those higher budgets, like I don't know, like 
50K per month or more than that. And once you're able to, let's say, allocate at least these 5,000 or 10,000 for a test for another platform, I think that's only the, the point in time when more or less it starts making sense to, to basically have these multiple platforms running in parallel. Because yeah, most for the most part also, which is typically the issue with these smaller platforms like Twitter, like Reddit, uh, is that unless yeah, you're running this typical branding, if you're focusing on performance, usually with this like 1K budget or 100 budget, you're not going to get much out of it. And uh, it's, it's very catered, let's say, towards these larger advertisers. Well, here they were specifically comparing the different, like this is from like only Twitter, for example, they were only comparing the difference between, let's say, if you have a carousel ad versus if you have video ad, for example, versus image. And uh, like they just saw that, that like once you were combining those, regardless of the like with the same frequency intact, let's say, uh, you can see that like the more formats they had, typically they had a bigger chance that users were remembering the campaigns as well as bigger chance that they were making a purchase. So the, the purchase intent also increased. Like my assumption is that this is associated with just the fact that you finally see it as something different and there's a bigger chance you you remember it and you don't automatically scroll down. Uh, and, and this should, I think, in that sense also apply if, when you're doing multiple platforms at the same time, because, uh, well, a format on each platform can be treated as a different format, yeah. Yeah. Not so well, basically, yeah. So it's it's like as I said, for example, this difference. Let's let's say if you're looking at purchases, like just on Twitter, if we're looking at it's it's again it's seven percent. It's not massive, but at the same time, also you have to look. I think at the algorithm. So the more formats you give, typically platforms tend to, in to some extent, I would say prioritize those which are utilizing more of the capabilities of the platforms. And I, I believe also that for most of the platforms, just using these more formats tickles the algorithm a bit more. <laughs> That's uh, Well, my, again, I'm basing my assumptions here. I, I can double check maybe how the study was made. Like uh, my assumptions, it's mainly on still this, like how people recall things. Uh, but I know that like when you when you are, for example, is the same thing as when you're running five ads in parallel in one campaign, you give the platform more options to choose from. And there's a bigger chance that you just give it more options. I, I'd say it's just the same that you, you are giving, let's say more options to test. Cause usually people let's say just make five images cause that's their easiest way to do it. They don't want to spend most time of it. And, uh, I think it goes in line with just as, as mentioned, like typically creative is the most important part. Like you, you can have an amazing product, but. If nobody likes your creative, you're still going to be bad in sales. So it's hard to tell one answer. I think it's probably a mix of everything. My assumption is mainly focused on this, like our brain focus of working that way. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this at this point, it's all assumptions because yeah. Add to, add to the, the meta, we usually talk about. So the legacy mindset was that there's customer loyalty and you sort of fight for it and sort of achieve this, you know, equilibrium where the customer is loyal and you don't have to invest in, in them anymore. So that's gone. What we talk about currently is being top of mind sort of approach. So as opposed to showing as many ads and as many placements as you can, you're engaging your customer in the sort of, hey, we're still current, we have this new offer, whatever it is that you do, maybe it's fintech product, right? So it probably will have a lot more cadence um, to your placements and to when you're showing things. E-commerce, for example, every new season, you're re-engaging your customer once more. So um, frequency and everything to do with data and measuring and understanding when is it you're placing stuff, that's what we focus on. But the idea here is that you're trying to compete for top of mind for the customer. So when they see your ad, it's like, oh, I know that brand. I want to I want to try whatever product is that they're serving or, you know, offering. 
um, as opposed to focusing on just you know pure data approach. So you're sort of combining together the neuroscience approach with the tech and the algorithm that is provided to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's, there's probably a little difference. We might um, go into specific examples. There are industries where there's very few players, telco and Latvia, we have three players, right? So any new acquisition that you make, is taking away from someone's business. So it's probably attracting customer via discount or via free device or something. Uh, but when we're talking about highly competitive landscape where there's, you know, e-commerce, there's, a, you know, however many participants in the industry. So you're really talking about getting into the top of mind for your customer. When you're talking about these competitive niche industries, um, marketing in those specifically revolves around around brand messaging. So it's all about, you know, upper funnel storytelling, um, sort of competing about this loyalty, but it doesn't, it doesn't really tell you that your customer is going to make that BP purchase. Um, for example, in quarter four sales, we see that so many new advertisers are going to lose their previous year customers just because they're, you know, counting on this loyalty. Uh, and of course, it is adjusted, as you shrewdly pointed out, to industries where there's highly competitive landscape or this sort of, you know, couple of players in there um, rewashing the same offers year over year. Um, so it will be case sensitive, but loyalty as such is gone. We had a really great slide um, we were presenting at Ecom 21 just last week, and it really talks about uh, customers being either rationally sort of their decision to purchase is either rationally uh, motivated such as myself so i'll reach uh, i'll research i'll think about it i'll sleep on this and there are people who make spontaneous decisions but very few of the people are still making decisions based on loyalty uh, maybe apple and um, car manufacturers would be sort of on the outlier side of things but think about cosmetics think about clothing think about um, I don't know, car sharing, for example, whichever is the cheapest I'm going to take, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I dove in the space where it's not for me. No, no. So from uh, our understanding and just our understanding, <laughs> our data, there's about 38 to 40 percent people making rational decisions and about 60 ish. So the remaining part uh, making spontaneous decisions, uh, those will vary per industry. So, again, if you're talking about telco, it'll probably be higher on the rational side if you're talking about uh what do i know <laughs> for example right so i'll look for something that i like that i like this season it's current and it will be more spontaneously driven uh, so it's really about understanding your product and then diving into that um you know about your product much more than your consumer does so throw that out and try to think of selling it to me for example when it comes to cosmetics <laughs> right so it's trying to combine that mindset outside of your perspective and then utilizing Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, the smarter you can layer these approaches or sort of touch points. So serve a, a Twitter ad, you know, where there's brand messaging, then serve a Google ad where the people are trying to find similar products or services. And then let's use that audience to retarget via Facebook. Perfect strategy. Yeah. 
I'm surprised that the Empire didn't come like unconsciously and very corrupted the new rationality. Oh, what is the name of this rationality? But from your perspective, from this or not, you are using so your platforms, I might say we might interpret that. Okay. Yeah. It, it it in general also goes like the cheaper the product is the more spontaneous like the, the yeah. and, and the higher and the more expensive and more important the product is for the user the more rational it will be but in general like one thing that i always like to remind to my customers and, and it, it's not a good thing but like people aren't smart on average <laughs> like that is something to keep an eye on aren't, aren't. like there are so many people who are quite dumb like <laughs> to put it broadly and 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 yeah and no one has heard it and everything but it's just that's that's the way it is like lots of people they are unable to read properly what you have written on your amazing brand messaging they are unable to see what you have put in your video uh i was speaking there was uh one client told me basically they were doing pre-sale for a clothing brand and uh it was written on the headline of that particular product pre-sale when you were ordering it was pre-sale on the headline of their email confirmation it was pre-sale and still they had around like 25 percent of people who bought it they were then very angry at them that uh, they why i don't receive my product now but they'll receive it in three weeks well it was very specifically stated there and that is something to remember but going back to your first question regarding like the frequencies and everything else uh on meta side we are seeing that everything basically if you have one particular creative up to three maximum four in some specific cases five frequency per one person that might be okay everything above that frequency meaning how many times each of the creatives is being seen by a person and yeah. up until five but uh, in ideal case up to three that is good and the same creatives afterwards they are just losing their performance yeah. and this is an example yeah from twitter which i have here this you can see the most like depend regardless of the objective like between two to three times of users seeing an ad on a weekly basis is typically when an action is made if and there's typically the difference between like three times seeing it or five times seeing it most likely like there's they're not there's not going to be a difference in their rationale whether they're going to remember it or whether they're going to be let's say uh, making a purchase or not uh so yeah yeah and then but if you're speaking about different platforms so even if you don't have like numerous creatives to put there even if you're putting the same creative on different platforms people are perceiving that as a as a new one so there goes the the neuroscientologist part which you mentioned beforehand so if I would see the same creative on Twitter I would say see the same creative on Meta and then I would see it on Google I would perceive it as being different because it looks a little bit different yeah. there might be a little bit more squarish than what might be a little bit wider or something like that and even though it is the same it, it just works like that I had a uh, seen like a proper funnel approach like this there is uh one store that was uh, retargeting me for um for like vinyl players and stuff like that and then I saw their Google ads which were exactly the same thing that they were showing to me two weeks ago on Facebook which I got totally uh fed up because they were showing to me too too often but on Google I was I, I noticed myself oh that that looks nice new and like something different and then when you're looking you know that it's the same thing that I've been looking at last few weeks regarding the the cookie deprecation that you mentioned uh, yeah. like imagine that uh like uh, how we are making yeah. our ads uh, those are job ads and people have to like click on a link which which has a very nice creative they click on it uh, it goes to one landing page but uh, then they have to go to another landing page to actually submit their information further uh, since this uh, these cookies are going to be deprecated ish uh, yeah. is it is it uh, useful to have a, have them land in our in our home page is is this uh, still relevant to make them you know that they click on the landing page that is on our uh home page but we are using a third party service where they can actually apply or we should just take that step out and make their lives easier to apply <laughs> well the, the main thing from what I know is just the, the focus is let's say going on from these third party to first party cookies so the platforms within their own like reach they're still going to have their own data so if it's a partner of yours probably I don't think it's going to impact much because it's a partner they have their own data you can probably they're they're going to find a way to get the data to you mm -hmm. uh I would say from that aspect probably not really like it's it's going to mainly like this, this impact mainly is I think affecting all these like bigger players like like all the Facebooks etc because now they're they're they the ones which already have more data they're going to benefit more from the situation than the ones that have less data at the point mm -hmm. 
starting that that the, our homepage is going to be shown in like I don't know Google search results. Is is that going to be impacted if there are, no. we had the, we had a visit we not not a visit we had a lecture from data state inspection they came they took all the cookies away and uh, <laughs> and uh, now we don't uh, we can't access uh, how many people have clicked how long they have st stayed on our page uh, none of those none of, none of that information goes to Google and our Google Analytics are looking pretty grim <laughs> uh, but um, after the after the visit from that state inspection all, all the numbers are like with a knife cut off and there's nothing so do we really need to keep this uh, extra step you know that uh, we are we, firstly we have to fight for their attention that they actually yeah. click on it and then they might wait I actually like my job and then they just go away <laughs> so do we do, would it be wise to keep keep them directing to our homepage or, or we can just directly send them to apply in the third party service well oh, yeah go ahead when it comes to Facebook um maybe Twitter has a different approach when it comes to Facebook you'll get the best results if you fill in so I'm assuming that's to do with lead generation mm -hmm. so you're trying to get the lead to go into another sort of platform mm -hmm. that decreases your user experience by each of the steps mm -hmm. so if you can cut out all those steps and get the user to fill in the Facebook form and remain on the same platform. The algorithm is going to be better tuned to optimize to find the leads that you're looking for. And two, you're you're going to increase the user experience. Thus, your campaign is going to be cheaper. Is going to have a much wider audience sequence. Um, and once you get the lead captured into the Facebook form, it's the same thing. So you you just adjust whatever lead form was on the third party mm -hmm. service into Facebook. And you'll have the same end result, and you just whatever is the people calling at the end or using email marketing or whatever is the last step, you just keep all in one platform. It's just going to create much more efficient um, landscape and much much more pleasant user experience. Mm -hmm. And on that note, also, like what was the reason behind you initially <laughs> having that extra step? Because, like, based on this one, I, I don't really the see the use for that. So. <laughs> yeah no I think it's always like uh well I haven't followed those rules specifically and how it's going to change so I think we're all just waiting on what what's the actual impact going to be but like yeah for example on Twitter side they they decided to move remove their legion format around 2015 and they still don't have it so the only way how we can actually push people would anyways be true like uh leading users away from Twitter to the to the site whether it's your site or whether it's the partner site uh doesn't matter but the, I think, yeah, the main thing is just yeah, to minimize, let's say, the, the funnel to try to make it as easier as possible for, for the user. And from your side, probably just like finding the middle ground of the business decision, let's say, how much it takes, let's say, time or development costs or whatever to, let's say, upkeep your own portal or whatever, or, or how much, let's say, let's say either you're saving money on get, paying for that third party or how much, let's say, it's easier to operate on that. And I think that's more on... On the, on the business decision you're taking there yeah and then another question regarding Bing have you heard of it <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually starting it is uh, quite aggressively starting to take over the search engines like uh, like uh, if you have Windows uh, Windows computer they are trying to make you to use all the search in in the bing what is your stance on bing ads and versus google ads are they last last data that we saw in latvia and baltics per se when it comes to search and we don't represent google or any of the search engines this is just martin speaking mm -hmm. uh, but the last data i saw personally was 98 percent are using google mm -hmm. so i think when we get to the point where bing is going to become relevant we'll find out about it organically mm -hmm. Uh, but for now, Bing really seems like a search engine that you can use in Western Europe, so mm -hmm. old, uh, old Europe, quote unquote, um, and some West um, Northern America by, I don't know, campaign types or, you know, very niche specific situations. I'd say focus on Google for now mm -hmm. and don't tell Microsoft that I ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> but are there no trends? Because they are they are being quite they're, aggressive. They're trendy, yeah. They are they are also using gamification methods yeah. to engage the audience. Like you can earn points, and you can you can then spend those points to get some gift cards. And they are even they also have partners in Latvia. So 
perhaps there are some trends that that the engagement in Latvia might might also increase. Today well, we're, we're probably uh, waiting until it gets to that point yeah. where it gets relevant, and then then we're going to think into it. With these platforms, it always goes like if you see that you have extra budget, that you're willing to yeah it's, risk to, like yeah, do it yeah. i don't see any downside yeah. to that yeah you might be spending something that will be unreasonably spent like, that's like the worst thing that will happen yeah and uh, at the same time like uh, i don't know much about like how bing ads work here but for the most part assuming it's similar to google at least it's an easy test that you can more or less like copy paste your setup yeah. mm -hmm. so also from like the the let's say time it takes to manage everything i think it should be a relatively easy thing to do if you're already doing google probably much cheaper now yeah <laughs> thank you so much right yeah okay yeah there we go the love question uh, <laughs> the question is going to be around the more creative side of marketing so uh right now i'm building a startup regarding uh, uh game testing uh, that we offer game developers game testing features and we have a competitor whose name is game testers so uh, it's how would you market your product when you have a a competitor whose name is the service you provide basically <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult like one of the things that uh, i've recently seen on studies that was regarding brand lift uh, so that means basically in Matthew, you have the possibility when you're doing upper funnel campaigns like awareness and stuff like that where uh i don't remember which was the base i think like five thousand euros you need to spend on campaigns and average and then uh, they are doing uh, surveys with customers. How they do they associate like your brand messaging with whatever they were saying and so on? And there I recently saw a study which was, I believe, regarding uh, BMW or Volkswagen, and uh, basically on their electric cars uh, machinery. But in the end, all of the stuff that they were doing there was going and attributing towards Tesla because people were associating those messages with Tesla, which very likely could be your case. And in, in that regard, I would recommend you to try, if you're doing some awareness, to try to do these sort of official tests because it might be useful. That being said, uh, I'm not really sure about the sales process and there I would need to hear more about the way how you are working and what's like the day-to-day -day business operations, but I wouldn't be probably working that much towards um, the awareness stages and everything, but I would be more working on like some traffic campaigns and trying to create a funnel for yourself so you can like lead those users wherever you want to lead them to. I think that that would be more effective. Yeah. Great answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. Thank you. All right. I guess we can wrap things up. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. the questions, everyone.